they did it, all I saw was there was somebody with a gun and he was wearing things on his ears and we were just trying to get away from him and everybody was trying to run away from him and everybody was in chaos. You could see there was people on the floor already that had gone hit. As we've mentioned, terrifying events unfolded over the weekend in both El Paso, Texas and Dayton, Ohio. The woman you just heard from survived the shooting at a local Walmart in El Paso. The alleged gunman in that shooting killed 20 people and injured dozens more in what police are calling a racially motivated attack. In Dayton, a gunman opened fire in the entertainment district. Nine people were killed, 27 were injured. Police are still working to determine a motive in that particular attack. But lawmakers, including 2020 Democratic presidential candidates, are blaming the deadly events this weekend in part on the president's rhetoric. Joining us via Skype with reaction to the shootings and the role gun control could play in the election coming up is Manny Garcia, executive director of the Texas Democratic Party. Texas, of course, is expected to actually play a pretty key role in 2020. According to reports, the GOP is already concerned about their hold on Texas and they are beefing up resources in the Lone Star State. Manny, thank you for joining us this morning. Thanks for having me. First of all, your reaction to the events of this past weekend in El Paso in particular. You know, it's, it's clear that white nationalist terrorism is present and it is deadly. Um, you know, Texas Democrats, we are mourning, we are sad, we are frustrated, we're angry, and we are redoubling our efforts to make sure that our elected leadership is getting something done about gun violence and about race in this country. And we cannot lose fact of the language um, and the toxic environment that has been created and often profited Republican politicians over these years. You know, before Donald Trump was spilling his vile rhetoric, Dan Patrick in Texas was spilling his vile rhetoric, um, Greg Abbott, Sid Miller, many of Texas's politicians have been profiting from this kind of sick, you know, and, 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 and just disgusting attitude towards Texas's rising electorate and new demographic. That needs to stop, and we need to immediately get towards solutions. And over the, 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 the time to come, we will make sure to hold those elected officials accountable. Manny, I do wonder, Beto O'Rourke ran on a pretty strong gun control platform and didn't go over, it was one of his least uh, well-polled things that he ran on in this state. How do you think that the Texas Democrats are going to, to grapple with the solutions after this? I know Senator John Cornyn, after Sutherland Springs, has been a big opponent of the fixing the background uh, systems act which seemed pretty widely popular in the state you know when you ask texans whether they would uh, uh ma make moves to uh, ensure universal background checks um, high capacity magazines uh, a number of common sense solutions they all agree it's not texans that are holding this back or voters that are holding this back it's politicians who simply lack the courage and moral obligation to get something done um, I, I think when, when we ask Texans, you know, all across this state, yes, they hold their gun, um, uh, their gun rights, and they're proud of, of the, the hunting culture that we come from. I own firearms myself. Um, but, you know, we, many of us do not believe that we need to be carrying them on our hip. Many of us do not want to make the job of law enforcement more difficult. Uh, many of us want to make sure that everybody is properly trained uh, and properly background checked so that we are all safe. Um, what is not the solution is, is what we have seen from a number of Republican Texas politicians who refuse to engage on any conversation um, about substantive common sense gun reform uh, and instead move the conversation over to hardening targets. Um, they start talking about the number of doors in schools, as Dan Patrick said. Uh, they talk about video games. Um, we need to get real about this. We need to make sure that we are ending gun violence with substantive reform. Um, and I think what we will see is the majority of Texas agrees that it's time to do something and they're ready for change. Manny, how do you feel specifically about how Republican elected leaders in Texas have responded to this El Paso massacre? You know, as a Latino, as a Texan, um, I, I am very disappointed in them, and I'm frustrated, and I'm angry. Um, they will not confront head-on, many of them did not confront head-on, that this is white nationalist terrorism, um, that, that the language that they use in their discourse um, affects this entire environment. 
that you know they have done policies in this state that have held back the Latino population from having any opportunity moving forward, whether it comes from health care or attacks on voting rights, um, attacks on our education. Um, and many of them have used the same kind of language that this shooter used, uh, talking about an invasion in Texas. And these, these words, they have consequences. And Texas's leadership needs to understand that. Manny, what, I mean, we also have to talk about 2020 here. We had uh, Beto O'Rourke, the congressman. He was set on the debate stage that Texas is a battleground state, given that he lost the election there and expected high turnout for Republicans and enthusiasm on the right. Do you think that that's the case going into 2020? You know, it, it, th this is all connected together. Texas is the biggest battleground state in the country. We are dramatically changing. We're changing quite rapidly. From 2014 to 2018, 1.8 million new Texans were added to the voter registration rolls. The majority people of color, the majority women. And to put that number into perspective, that's the like the entire voting age population of New Mexico. In wow. four yeah. years, a whole New Mexico got dropped into Texas. Th that's why things are changing so quickly. And you know, when when we look at the opportunity now, we see that we're just nine seats away from flipping the Texas House. There were 22 seats within single digits. Um, we have more congressional targets here than any state in the country. We have a United States Senate race that is already within the margin of error. And when you ask Texans if they would vote for Donald Trump or someone else, someone else currently wins. Hmm. Hmm. That's remarkable. And Manny, one of the things that we've seen as a trend across the country is as electorates change, rather than trying to appeal to those electorates, Republicans try to change the rules of the game and disenfranchise that rising electorate. Um, seems to me that Texas has been doing that same thing and following that same playbook. Absolutely. I, I started my career um, before I came to the Democratic Party, I was the director of policy for the Mexican-American Legislative Caucus, which is the oldest and largest Latino caucus in the country, and worked in the Texas redistricting and voter identification case. Um, and in that case, what we saw was a Republican Party that was deliberately making acts, intentional discrimination, to make sure that Latinos and African-Americans and Asian-American Pacific Islanders, that their voice was not heard by their government. Uh, we, we had a famous redistricting case that went through the entire decade. This is after the decade before we had seen a redistricting case in the, the Tom DeLay case. Um, and, and what we see now is uh, that very same Tom DeLay district, that very same area where Tom DeLay came from, uh, is now trending Democratic. It's the 22nd congressional district. Pete Olson within it decided to retire, is no longer going to uh, want to face the voters or face accountability. Um, and we suspect that we will be doing great work within that district, um, one in which it came in single digits this, just this last cycle. Mm -hmm. So uh, Manny, we've also seen the retirement of Congressman Will Hurd. And this morning, um, another congressman from the DFW, the Dallas-Fort Worth area. How many of these retirements have we seen so far in the Texas GOP delegation, and do you expect to contest all of them? Look, in the in the past four weeks, we've seen about four. Wow. Um, at the state house level, we're also seeing uh, Republicans decide to retire as well instead of face the voters. Um, I think what they understand is that Texas is changing, that Texas is a battleground state, and they're not willing to put up a fight. Um, because they know just how hard and grueling this is going to be. Um, and for those in Congress, they're they are going to run and then end up being in the minority. Um, and I think they understand that already, that there is no way for Republicans to ever take the United States House back right now. Um, and so because of that, they're, they're choosing to leave. Manny, thank you so much. Um, our hearts are with the state of Texas this morning. We really appreciate having your perspective. Thanks, Manny. Thank you. Next up on Rising, Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard had her breakout moment during last week's Democratic debate with her Senator Kamala Harris takedown. <laughs> and journalist Michael Tracy will tell us that the attack was far from unexpected. He will explain more next. <laughs> 